So okay, so we we are the British Museum today, and um, today the uh, the tour is uh, uh, the Bible, especially the Old Testament, in the British Museum. And uh, today we are hoping to go through um, some wide collection that um, British Museum has to establish the veracity, the historicity of the Old Testament. And that's what we are hoping to do. We have Brother Raju, uh, Dinesh. Um, uh, Ruby and Brother Ray there and uh, hopefully as a team and of course JC here hopefully we cover much ground. Okay, so this entire stretch of um, galleries here are sort of the oldest sort of artifacts in the entire human history. Um, for example, on that side you find Levant, which is sort of Israel, Jordan um, kind of area there. This is Mesopotamia. Now, just to kick off uh, the sort of um, trip, uh, the, the tour here, of course when we take the Bible, what are the first few things that would come to our mind in terms of being able to verify? Uh, firstly, creation creation and then moving a bit further uh, would be something like Noah's flood mm -hmm. and then a bit further more is essentially you know all sorts of how from Shem Ham Japheth there are a few different people groups that emerge from there and um, ultimately I don't know if you know if, you, if you're familiar with this person called Nimrod um, and then of course we're moving on to Abraham and what kind of things were in Mesopotamia at that time. So that's roughly the initial few things of the Old Testament. Just to give a rough idea of the timeline, we essentially, if we, if we stick to the biblical chronology, we're talking about a creation being around 4000 BC, Abraham uh, being around uh, 2150 BC, and about 350 years before Abraham, was the Noah's flood. So that's the rough sort of timeline for this particular area that we're going to check out at the minute. And that is the first artifact I wanted to cover. The one at the top, the tiny cylinder at the top, sort of slightly blackish. And then on the right hand side you see a mud a mud uh, sort of slate where the cylinder has uh, had its impression on and then below is a picture of what the impression is sort of magnified so at the top the three images is what we are, what we care about and that is what the British Museum fondly calls Adam and Eve seal I don't know if you see that somewhere in the middle of the yeah. middle of the paragraph there and the reason it's called Adam and Eve seal is because you find a man a woman a tree and snakes sort of very closely um, resembling our Adam and the serpent, the talking, uh, talking serpent and the tree of knowledge of good and evil sort of story. Now if you look at the dating of that seal, as you can see it's 2200 to 2100 BC. Now in terms of uh, uh, sort of dateable artifacts that we have in the British Museum, that's, that's pretty much, I mean, 2000 BC, 3000 BC is as far as we could get to properly datable artifacts. Beyond that, we really can't date. And here is where the entire controversy of whether all the evolution, uh, millions of years, or datable few thousand years sort of history, um, that particular controversy come in. But anyway, that's Adam and Eve seal. Um, if you look at the uh, larger plaque there, you see the name Ur. Uh, the name Ur should ring a bell to us because Ur is uh, the land, is the city from where Abraham came out, who later became Abraham. Um, so again, looking at the time, time uh, dating, we're talking about 2000 BC to 2000 BC, which is pretty much, if you, if you go through most of the artifacts in the British Museum, the latest they'd be dated to would be something in that vicinity. So that's Adam and Eve seal. Um, the question is, why did they care to sort of record something like that? And the answer could be that people were very familiar with the story of Adam and the woman and the uh, serpent. And therefore, um, even though this is after Noahic flood times, people still took the trouble to sort of put that down on some sort of a 
seal so that there is a memory of that. So that's that's roughly um, what we are talking about in the in this area. Cool. The next important thing I wanted to look at is uh, are things related to the flood, Noah's flood. Um, now um, you might have come across various debates on whether the flood happened, whether there was a worldwide flood or not and so on. But what we find is if you go to any ancient civilization, every single one of them have a story of a worldwide flood and a family being saved from that flood. That story is there in every ancient civilization. And in British Museum, we, are, we have uh, two specific archaeological records which I wanted to look at. Um, one of them, unfortunately, is not on display because they have taken that out um, for um, research, I think. And that is called Atrahasis Epic. It's supposed to be here. So when you come the next time or so, you can check out if it is there. Uh, not here this time, but that is one of the two artifacts I want to look at in regards to the worldwide flood. So this is Atrahasis Epic. And the other one I wanted to look at is on the other section, which we'll try and see if we can have some access to. And that is what is called the Gilgamesh Epic. Gilgamesh Epic and Atrahasis Epic are two of the very ancient stories clearly recorded in archaeological artifacts of a worldwide flood. For example, in the case of Gilgamesh epic, you have the central character called Gilgamesh, who would very closely resemble to the biblical Nimrod. In the Bible, soon after the flood uh, was over, from Noah, you have Shem, Ham, Japheth, and from Ham, you have Cush. Cush is one of the sons of Ham, and from Cush, you have a character which shows up called Nimrod. And he became sort of the first worldwide emperor sort of person. He, he was the one who ascertained his uh, authority over others, sort of subdued them. And he was a mighty hunter. Uh, and that was his credibility. So the Bible records by saying Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now there is a bit of discussion on what that before the Lord actually means. And one take on that is it's not really before the Lord as in oh, yeah, just, just for the Lord to see but rather directly opposed to the Lord um, and this is where this, uh, this particular story which is there in multiple um, ancient civilizations come in which is there was a hunter who essentially said God who sent the flood to destroy you earlier does not care about you anymore but I am a hunter I can protect you I can protect you from all sorts of wild animals because I am capable of doing that. And because he sort of ascertained, he ascertained his capacity as a hunter, he essentially said, all of you can come follow me. I'll rule you, I'll protect you. And that is the first sort of world emperor that we come across. And the Bible would go on to give details of the cities that he built. Uh, if you go through the after Noah's flood times, before ta the Tower of Babel, he is the first person to build cities, i.e. to organize people around uh, seemingly himself as the central figure. Um, and um, related to Gilgamesh, we find this particular thing here called uh, the demon Humbaba. You see that uh, thing there? Now, um, to people who are familiar with um, sort of ancient arche um, artifacts, that might resemble, um, that, that might look similar to something else. Now, even if you're not familiar with ancient artifacts, if you know anything about, let's say, Indian religion, you might be familiar with all sorts of demon-like faces which people put up at the front of their houses. And the idea is, if you look at that, spirits would get scared. And run away. And this is sort of a precursor for that, Humbaba. Uh, the, the main point I'd like to make here is, the name Humbaba, some people actually say, etymologically can be related to Yahweh. Huawa, Wawa, Yahweh. So there is an etymological relationship with Yahweh. How does Yahweh come in into this picture? And how does he come in as some sort of a demon, as as a, specified here. Here is where we need to read through the story of Gilgamesh in detail. 
when we go through the story like i said earlier he essentially would say god who destroyed you through a flood doesn't care about you anymore i am his replacement i am the god of the earth i will protect you in other words he puts himself in the place of the actual god and the actual god who sent the flood was yahweh and this gilgamesh saw the one who sent the flood as an enemy as someone he is trying to replace as someone who doesn't care about human beings and the the other minor point here uh, you might know paul in one particular place where he was preaching he essentially said to the, when he saw a, pla, uh, a a statue with the name as unknown god or dedicated to the unknown god you might remember that to the unknown god paul essentially said that unknown god is yahweh and uh, that is the god i've come to preach about yeah you might remember that a bit perhaps if you go through the book of acts you'll find that the significance of that is many christians don't know the significance they think well paul is just trying to say if you think about any superior god that's who yahweh is uh, no it actually goes beyond that and the significance actually comes from the first story that gilgamesh advanced the story that gilgamesh advanced is the one who sent the flood does not want to know you and you can't know him he doesn't care about you anymore he you can't know him and that is where unknown god comes in this particular idea of an unknown god again shows up in multiple different ancient civilizations or in a country like india this sort of trickles in through even though india in terms of the records that we have in um, some of the religions there isn't old enough stories have trickled through and then reached there for example in india that particular uh, unknown god is called brahma brahma is the unknown god if you go through india you won't find a temple for brahma you would never find a temple for brahma you would find a temple for shiva on the other hand but shiva is a hunter god he is a hunter he'll sit on a um, on a on a skin which is from a, a wild animal from a, a yeah so he'd sit on that and he's a hunter god he he shows up as a hunter and that is his qualification closely resembling the hunter god claim of gilgamesh and that doesn't show up only in india it shows up in multiple other civilizations a hunter god who claimed about the unknown god who doesn't care about us anymore so anyway so that is the relationship that we have here and that is uh, uh, humbaba which um, um, closely resembles uh, huawa now what we also can find is that there are various um, sort of play tablets there and if you can maybe look at a couple of them see they they talk about magical spells uh, and they and they essentially if you if you go through some of them what they talk about or how we could curse other things um, 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 in the name of a superior spirit or whatever um, omens and so on so that is the kind of religion that developed right at the start and you find these in some modern day some religions which have survived till modern times like in the case of um, hinduism again if you go through some of the uh, what they call slogans some of the um, things that are recited what you would find is they are really curses curses against people who would cause you hurt but the idea of that all of that came from there as we move forward from uh, uh, from the time of uh, the flood the next significant phase in terms of the biblical narrative is of course the tower of babel now this particular thing if you look at that comes from ur uh, which is which later on became babel china babel um, and then uh, subsequent uh, sorry it was earlier called china sorry by the way uh, ur is the name of the town by the time abraham lived china and babel are terms which were used even prior to that Uh, but what we find is there geographically where urus we find we find evidences to suggest that people were so obsessed about building these massive things apparently intending to reach to the gods apparently intending to reach to the gods now the bible gives a few particular reasons why the tower of babel was built 
first of all, it was meant to be some sort of a landmark for people to look at and come to, to meet as a, as a place of meeting. That was one intention. The other one was to establish a name for human beings. And the third one, the third purpose uh, we find in the Bible is that they want to reach out to the gods. Now, that is where, again, you've, you all the tall, the, this is the primitive form of temples that we find in various different places. Um, um, so the idea again is walk through and reach and perhaps you might go and meet with God. Um, the idea of walking up and being at the highest places and reaching God is recorded in various civilizations in terms of the um, historical narratives that have been communicated, not alone in terms of the archaeological artifacts here. And the idea being, oh, there are gods up there, we want to go and meet with them, um, sort of idea. So that, that is a primitive, <laughs> primitive form of Tower of Babel. Uh, now, during Abraham time, another significant thing happened. After, sorry, after the Tower of Babel, the next significant person is Abraham, according to the Bible. And during Abraham's time, something significant happened, uh, which you might be aware of, which is, you had in uh, Genesis chapter 14, there is a record of a, of a battle or a war between two alliances of kings two alliances of kings and you might know of the fact that uh, some kings essentially took hold of Lot and his family destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, took these people as captives and took them away and while they were, they were away Abraham wanting to save Lot, he chased after them, got hold of them, recovered uh, the people, recovered some of the possessions and this is when he comes and meets Melchizedek. Yeah, so, so that's a familiar part of the um, narration we find in Genesis chapter 14. Now, uh, the significance of that related to what we're going to look at in a minute is, um, is um, uh, the alliance of kings that attacked, attacked the nations of Sodom and Gomorrah and a couple of other nations. That alliance includes a king called Amraphel. Genesis chapter 14 records his name as Amraphel. Interestingly, historically, uh, time-wise roughly matching, but historically and in terms of details, the person who ma matches that description is the one who is recorded here as Hammurabi. Bible records him as Amraphel, and here we see Hammurabi. Uh, now what we find is this Hammurabi is uh, of course uh, described as, um, as a king who rules, ruled over China, I think, in, uh, in the Bible. And he, this guy here, according to extra-biblical artifacts, rules Babylon so so matches time wise matches similar and what we find is um, what is called the code of Hammurabi the code of Hammurabi is essentially a detailed uh, record of a law that this particular very prominent king had similar to law of Moses some people even say that this is the precursor to the law of Moses but the, but that view is a, is a bit um, has a bit of a challenge to it. There are a few issues with that particular view. So, in other words, some people claim Moses sort of copied his law from here and claimed it to be from God. That is absolutely not true. Looking at the extensiveness of Mosaic law and uh, comparing that against the level of cover that um, Hammurabi's code has, and also looking at some specific codes and the definition of justice. Mosaic law is very, very different from the code of Hammurabi. But the fact of the matter is Hammurabi did have a code and that is clear through this particular record and there are a few other, um, few other uh, sort of stone pillars which uh, with the uh, Hammurabi code um, uh, in, in one of them in Louvre Museum and so on. So, so we have a, a reasonable idea of what Hammurabi had as his code. Now as you can see cuneiform writing at the top that the guy on the left there, by the way that picture there that picture there corresponds to this um, and the idea is Hammurabi is supposed to have been sitting on the right here and here the, 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 the writing there is supposed to be his law and if you go through the law here in this particular artifact and also the artifact in the Louvre Museum and so on what we find is Hammurabi's code is one of the most extensively preserved writing from ancient Babylon. Uh, but more crucially for us, of course, the connection with Amraphel. If you look at this particular lady, 
so that's a goddess that's a goddess and the name of that goddess um, is Ishtar and as you can see then goddess is sitting on top of these wild animals with multiple hands in this particular version she only has two hands but in later versions what you would find is she would begin having many more hands and this particular lady is called Ishtar and um, you might be already familiar with her in a couple of different ways some may be in one way and some in some other ways for instance well, how do we normally how do people Christians normally call the day of resurrection Easter. of the Lord Jesus Christ Easter. they call the name Easter but if you kind of think through and see oh, how is the name Easter related to the Bible you wouldn't find any way of connecting the name Easter with the Bible but also add to that the idea that if you go to a supermarket during the time of uh, re the resurrection day what do you find well, you find eggs being sold bunnies being sold and so on and you know, if you ask the question where do these things come from how are these related to the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ again you won't find any connection but what you would find uh, what you would find though is that the eggs and the bunnies and so on would be related to this particular lady who is called Ishtar um, um, and the and uh, that's one way you might be familiar with this particular lady there is another way uh, because Raju and uh, Ruby are here and Dinesh are here maybe I'll mention that also the other way you might be familiar with this lady but not in not so in an obvious way is that you might be familiar with this goddess Indian goddess called Kali have you heard the, of the name Kali yeah Kali Shiva and Parvati became Nadraja and Kali and remember a few minutes ago I said Shiva is the Nimrod Gilgamesh um, and what you would find is the version the story related to Ishtar is exactly the same story and uh, Ishtar is really the version of Kali Gilgamesh is the sort of consort consort consort, consort that this particular person had and this is what we find when Shiva becoming Nadraja, Ka, Parvati become Kal, becoming Kali, you'd find uh, the hunter god becoming the sort of very um, angry god and uh, the, the consort of the hunter god becoming an anti um, angry Ishtar. So that's the um, story we find. And the way it's related to the Bible again is that Nimrod. Nimrod is that mighty hunter before the Lord. He was opposed to the Lord. And uh, one thing we began, we begin finding in the uh, in the history of the world is that very early on, this particular lady has a son, and she claims. And um, historically, it's a bit of a problem because she had a son when she was not supposed to have a son because she didn't have a husband at that time. And that is where she went on to claim, "Oh, I had a son because God Himself gave me a son, and I had an in, in her in the version of this story, I had a sexual intercourse." with God and that is how I got this son so don't ask about this anymore is the explanation she gave um, and that is the same story you'd come across in various different ancient civilizations um, so that's Ishtar and it is very unfortunate that in the Christian church we begin using her name to refer to the resurrection day um, and we begin using all the eggs and bunnies and so on so if we get to know about this particular history, I think we should stay far away from using the name Ishtar or Easter and should maybe go just with the pure name of Resurrection Sunday. That's how I normally call it, Resurrection Sunday. Let me make a couple of other points, please. Just looking at the, um, looking at the map here, uh, the fact that there is, a, there is a town or city called Mari here. There is another called Ebla here. And I don't know why they have removed, in, the, in an earlier version of the map, which I remember taking a picture of a few years ago here, there was a, there were, they had also marked, taken the trouble to mark another city or town, which must be somewhere in that sort of vicinity, which is called Nuzi. Nuzi, Mari and Ebla are very important biblically, because from Nuzi, Mari and Ebla, we find some very important clay tablets, records clay tablets which shed some important light on some of the historical narration around Abraham, Jacob and so on. Let me give you a few examples. For example, you know uh, in a couple of different places uh, Abraham and in one particular place Isaac. 
go on to refer to their wives, respective wives, as sisters. Now, now we might be a bit confused with sister or wife or what. And Abraham also says that his wife is actually a sister in one particular way of relationship with him. And the other thing that we find is from the tablets we find here, sisterhood was a role that can be bestowed upon people. Like adopting your children, you can, you can essentially make someone your sister, qualify someone or credit someone or give a certificate that someone is your sister. And the point is, in that particular time period, through artifacts we get from there, what we find is being a sister is even closer than being a wife in terms of status to the husband, to the, to the man. And here is where it seems like from the artifacts what we find is when a man marries his wife, depending on how pleased with his wife he is, he sometimes would also elevate his wife to the status of being a sister. And this is very important uh, because Abraham uses that, oh, she is my sister explanation very easily. And later on Isaac also does something similar. But they both can be justified very simply if we know the historical cultural context. And that is one. And the other one that we find also is, you might be familiar with the story of uh, Jacob um, having taken a wife, uh, two wives, or oh, four wives actually, two wives and two maid servants uh, corresponding to the two wives from Laban. And where did he live? Uh, where did Laban live? Laban lived in, uh, in that sort of area. Uh, Laban lived in Haran. Haran is a city in where Ab near, from, from near where Abraham came from. Haran is supposed to be in that sort of vicinity. And that is where Laban lived. Not in Israel, because remember Jacob ran away from his father, from his brother, thinking his brother would kill him. So he uh, ran away and he lived there, acquired his wives and possessions and all those things, and then returned back to Israel later on. But there is an interesting aspect of that story, which is when returning back, Rachel, one of his wives, would take a, a household god, a little statue of some sort, and bring that with her, take that with her. Now, interestingly, Laban and uh, Jacob had a bit of a friction, even when we towards the end of their life together, when Jacob was still in Haran. After Jacob and his family had left, you find um, Laban chasing Jacob and the entire crew. We find Laban chasing Jacob and the entire crew as if it's an important business with all sort of his, um, all the people he could muster. They, they were chasing. The question you might wa want to ask is why was he chasing? Even though there was a bit of a friction, of course he had let them, let them go. Now why is he chasing them as if they are his enemies, as if something very important has happened? And what you would find is he chased them and got to a place and he he'd essentially complained, my household God is lost. I, saw, I, I, I think some, one of you has stolen it. And then they'll ultimately figure out uh, that uh, uh, Rachel would know it is, she has it, but she wouldn't say that she has it. Um, ultimately, they'll come to an agreement. The agreement is, Laban would say, okay, fine, I haven't found this, no problem. I don't want to cause any further trouble. But just agree to this one particular thing, which is, you should not cross over. Once you have gone, in, gone to Canaan, you should not cross over this particular mound that they build. Cross over that and come further north. Likewise, I won't come, but you should not come to the north, was the agreement. And the question you might ask is, why did he come to an agreement? Why did he chase them in the first place? Why is that all important? Some of the artifacts we find uh, in these cities shed a light, very important light, very crucial light, and um, uh, helps us understand how the Bible captures very, very detailed historical narratives in a subtle way. And the point is, it seemed like during that time, it is these household little gods, figurines, little statues, which are the registry documents for your property. As you can see, those figurines, which are like little gods, but they are actually, the main, the, the main thing there is a peg, which would go in the um, ground. Uh, you can see is slightly larger versions on that side of the pegs. Things like these were used to 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 go uh, to go with properties which were built.
to denote various things like who is protecting our house. Two, in the case which uh, we spoke about earlier, um, who owns the house, depending on who has access to the uh, figurine. You should see, you should see sort of a dragon, dragon on this side, and then a man trying to fight with that on that side. And this is essentially the Gilgamesh version in Assyria. So if you if you try hard, do you see the face of the dragon there? Do you see that? Uh, sort of uh, facing back. And do you see a, an eye there? Do you see an eye there? So that is the person. That is the person trying to fight with that dragon. And that is the that is the picture. So that's what you see here artistically rendered. The idea again is Gilgamesh, who is a mighty hunter, is uh, showing his, uh, his capability to protect people from uh, uh, dangerous animals, and in this case, uh, spiritual. Um, and he, he ascertains his, uh, his role as a protector god of the earth. So that is what we find, and this is from the Assyrian period, which is very early in um, history. So now we are going to begin looking at the Kingdom of Israel. Initially it is the United Kingdom of Israel and then of course you might know after the time of Solomon, King Solomon, the United Kingdom of Israel would split into the Northern Kingdom of Israel and the Southern Kingdom of Judah. So that is the Kingdom period. Now with that in mind, let me... Yeah, in relation to Israel, there are four very important earliest references of Israel during Iron Age times outside of the Bible. Four very important ones. One of them is this. The other three are what are called Selda and Stile, uh, Mesha inscription, um, and there is one more, and the name escapes my mind now. Oh, yes, yeah, so the Menapta Stile. So, Mernapta Stile comes from Egypt, uh, Teldan Stile from the Levant, um, and then the third one is Moabite stone or Moabite inscription from Moab, or three main, and the fourth, the fourth uh, important artifact which, which record the existence of the nation of Israel outside of the Bible in a very solid form is this. And thankfully, it's in British Museum. It's what is called Kurk Monolith or Kurk Stila. And this comes from the Assyrians. And essentially, what it is is so here, yeah, so you could see a you could see a king standing there. And that king is Shalmaneser the third. Uh, Shalmaneser the third is not recorded by name in the Bible. Is not recorded by name, but. Shalmaneser III records a few, a couple of very important biblical events. One of which corresponds to King Ahab. You might be familiar with King Ahab. You know, um, uh, Elijah, when he went and uh, uh, when he challenged the priests of Baal uh, for, a, for a duel on, on uh, top of uh, uh, Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel, I think. Uh, um, uh, I forget the name of the mount. Yeah, I think it is Mount Carmel, but may, maybe maybe take that with a pinch of salt. But essentially the idea is, let's see whose God is the true God. Let us see who, whose God can come and consume an offering. And that is the challenge that uh, Elijah had. And the ruler of that time is King Ahab. King Ahab's wife um, is, is Jezebel. Is a person called Jezebel who is not from Israel. And she is the one who had let all these foreign prophets and priests come in and gain stronghold within Israel. And so that is the King Ahab. We know him significantly through his uh, opposition to Yahweh. He did repent once, but then later on did various evil things on top. In any case, the point is at some stage in King Ahab's life, um, along with a couple of Syrian kings, there was a coalition of kings who went to fight against sort of a prominent ruler in that vicinity who is Shalmaneser of Assyria. He was a very prominent guy. You had the pharaoh prominent in the sort of African area, but then up in the uh, in the uh, Nile Delta, sorry, not, uh, Tigris Euphrates Delta, 
the prominent kingdom at that time was Assyria and the emperor, the ruler of Assyria at that time was Shalmaneser III. And a coalition of kings went to fight against him. They couldn't fight alone with him, so they went as a team. One of them is King Ahab. And King Shalmaneser, as you can see, there is cuneiform writing on this uh, stila. Cuneiform writing. And King Shalmaneser records the fact of that particular uh, battle, which is called Battle at Karkar. It's popularly known as uh, Battle at Karkar. So you, you see that there. And essentially, he records the fact that King Ahab of Israel had, had been one of the kings he had to fight against. So, so that is the and, the, and the coalition of kings was led by kings of Damascus and Hamath, who were uh, the Syrian sort of kings. But uh, even in Syria, there were multiple different uh, groups, one based on Damascus, another based on Hamath. And then Assyrian, sorry, the, the Israel's king, Ahab, joined with them and a few other kings to go and fight against Shalmaneser III. And so the point is, four ancient, four Iron Age references to the nation of Israel, outside of the Bible, one of which is this, one earliest reference to the nation of Israel. So with that, we'll now get into um, sort of the rest of the interaction that the Assyrian kings had with the nation of Israel. So, let's take... So there's a group there We'll wait for them to go, but while we are waiting, let me just introduce uh, this particular obelisk. So if we, if we look at that again, uh, the second row, that is King Shalmaneser and that is King Jehu of the nation of Israel. King Jehu, of course, bowing down before Shalmaneser because he's a subdued king. And he brings, he brings a list of, he brings uh, all sorts of tributes. Here. Corresponding to the second row, you'd find, uh, say, uh, like you see, that's you, that's Jehu, Yahweh, of the house of Umri, it says, which is Omri, house of Omri, Omri being, I think, the father of uh, Ahab. Uh, King Jehu of Israel appears, and he is in 2 Kings, chapters 9 and 10. In the Bible, we have a record of a Shalmaneser, but it is important for us to note that that is not this Shalmaneser. The Shalmaneser that we have in the Bible is Shalmaneser the fifth, not Shalmaneser the third. This is Shalmaneser the third, but of course Jehu is from the Bible, uh, and Ahab of Israel is from the Bible. Now, what kind of time period are we talking about here? So, like, um, I don't know if I mentioned briefly earlier, um, the nation of Israel, after the time of King Solomon, split into the northern Israel and southern Judah. And northern Israel, of course, was uh, ruled by uh, different kings. I think nine different dynasties ruled the northern Israel. I think the second or third of which is uh, King Omri's dynasty, of, uh, of which uh, is King Ahab. But ultimately, uh, Assyrian kings, of course, they, Assyrian kings began making inroads during the time of King Jehu. They began making inroads into the nation of Israel. But it is a king called a king called Pul or Tiglath Pileser, as recorded in the Bible by name. Shalmaneser the third isn't recorded by name in the Bible, but Tiglath Pileser is recorded by name, both as Tiglath Pileser and as Pul. Two different names for the same king are given in the Bible. The importance of the name Pul is, for a long time people were thinking the Bible hasn't given accurate record because they didn't find a king called Pul in Assyria. So they were thinking well, the Bible talks about a king but we don't know this king called Pul. Uh, so the Bible has obviously got its facts wrong. Until later, um, uh, until the time when they actually figured out an artifact from Assyria where they realized Tiglath Pileser III had a, an alternative name which was also in other artifacts recorded as Pulu. And the Bible had captured that very niche detail, which wasn't available through any other artifact, which the Bible has been carrying for hundreds of years. 
before even we had access to an archaeological artifact. So that's the significance of Tiglath Place of the Third. We're going to go around the corner there to check out some of the records of Tiglath Place and number the third, the, 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 the third there. And in particular, uh, we won't have details of how we attacked Israel or any any such thing. But what we would find is we'd find Tiglath Place capturing some um, uh, prisoners from Israel. We we have there Israel some Israelites becoming prisoners to Tiglat Pileser um, and uh, being taken away to Assyria. Now you might be familiar with the story of Samaritans. You know the Bible talks about Samaritans and uh, by the time of Jesus uh, the Samaritans were uh, regarded as people who are not good enough spiritually in the sight of Jews and uh, the background, where did the Samaritans come from? The background to Samaritans is really Samaritans are a mixed people group between the northern nation of Israel and some foreigners which Assyrian kings brought in for them to have in interracial marriage in the land of northern Israel. So the mixed people group are who are called Samaritans. And this is where, remember, Jews didn't, um, Jews didn't see uh, um, Samaritans as worthy spiritually. But having said that, the Samaritan woman who had a discussion with uh, Jesus also referred to Jacob as her father. You might remember, he said, uh, this, is, uh, th this well was dug by our father, Jacob. Yeah, she would, she would refer to Jacob. As, so that's where you, you need to ask the question, well, if, these, if she was from Jacob, how come she wasn't found to be worthy? Because Jacob is Israel. How come she was found not to be worthy by the Jews? Uh, looked down as a Samaritan and the reason is purely because Samaritans were a mixed group and therefore could could um, some of them possibly had details of their lineage but even generally speaking they could trace their lineage back all the way to Jacob plus other people groups so they are certainly a mixed people group but Jacob is also a patriarch for them and this is where you get the idea of Samaritan Pentateuch where they preserved the Bible on their own regard, which the Jews don't regard uh, in a in a in a in high esteem. Curiously, for us, very relevantly, are these these people here. Now, these people are identified as people of Israel, and the way they are identified as their people, as people of Israel is through their clothing. Now. Um, of course, when we go through some of these artifacts in detail, when we dwell on it, when we compare how some of these uh, people are um, uh, depicted here versus how some other people are depicted, what you find is different people groups were uniquely identified in artifacts like these through differences of their clothing, of the style of their hair, of the style of their cap and so on. So when you go through them in detail, you'd know. So people who study these in detail would know, looking at the picture, oh, that's an Israelite. And if they see an Arab, they'd say, oh, that's an Arab. So, so that's all. But uh, yeah, uh, but the quick point here is these are Israelites, of course, captured and an Assyrian um, god following, following them. And you find uh, cattle being also taken uh, to them. And here you have the king on the on the chariot there. So, yeah, that is um, Tiglath Pileser number third. Um, Tiglath Pileser number third, who is also called Pul in uh, Pulu in some of the other records, and the Bible calls him both as Tiglath Pileser and Pul. The next thing we are going to look at is uh, once that group moves away uh, are, are essentially those particular things there. That's supposed to be part of a gate, a reconstruction of which is here, a massive gate, which is in Assyria. And as you can see, all these groups of metal here, this, these, these are what are called Balavat gates. And the strips of metal metal all over there. That, this is a reconstruction. The original is there. You know uh, Nineveh? Who is the prophet who was sent to Nineveh? Jonah. 
and what was his problem he said oh, i can't go uh, the reason he didn't want to go is he realized god want to destroy nineveh but if he goes and preaches and they if they repent then he won't destroy it. there are two problems with this one of them is his reputation is on the line as a prophet if he says something and if it doesn't happen his reputation is on the line and number two is something we are going to look at in a minute which is what kind of people were the assyrians you know the bible why did god even want to want to destroy them god didn't send um, uh, jonah to any to any other country but to nineveh to to assyria why did god see destruction of nineveh to be paramount at that time we'll take a look um yeah it's so, so so all these people for being taken away war chariots horses and so on but if you focus your attention to that section please do you see six little men do you see six little men impaled on sort of okay, sticks yeah. there sticks, yeah. Yeah? yeah and you can imagine of course where the sticks have gone into and how they have been lifted up you can imagine and the fact of the matter is people historians claim this is this is sort of the precursor for crucifixion mm. essentially lifting someone on a stick on a stick on a stick and take so that's uh, uh, some of the records as a matter of fact to describe things like this would actually say he was uh, suspended or hung on a uh, tree um, and there is also a couple of other interesting um, phrases which are used in the bible which uh, which um, which uh, talk about how uh, this is done but more crucially just imagine assyrians doing that the the what re- what the assyrians had a habit of essentially capturing those who rebelled or those who they considered to be important enemies and parading them in that particular way and the intent the the, the idea to be demonstrated is you better don't mess up with us and of course if jonah if god wants jonah to go and preach to them and if jonah thought god could change his mind you could imagine what jonah might have thought as to what could happen to him mm. and so on uh, all sorts of things could have gone through his mind uh, now some of these some of these uh, people who are depicted here are actually israelites who were captured so israel became uh, part of the kingdom of assyria under tiglath pileser pul mm. shalmaneser the third came before him he hadn't captured all of israel but he still captured some israelites how do we know that we know that through his depictions there he seems to have attacked a few different people and have taken prisoners we find that in um, in the balavath gate depiction so that's sargon the second the one on the left there so let me let me read a quick verse from uh, from the bible isaiah chapter 20 verse 1 It says in the year that Tartan gave to Ashdod when Sargon the king of Assyria sent him and he fought against Ashdod and took it Sargon Isaiah 21 this particular king has been recorded by Sargon So uh, it should also show slings being used you know we of course we know about king David using his sling as an important weapon against Goliath we see slings being used as weapons um, not not long after king david's time and here you see judean prisoners judean prisoners being uh, taken away taken away and uh, and essentially you have the musical instrument lyre being played there and this um, rings a bell in terms of you know by the river is that this man was forced to play songs on the way Uh, of them have being exiled they were forced to play songs um for the benefit of the uh, captors uh, some stones which are most likely were used uh, with slings as you can see so these are i mean david when he when he attacked goliath might have used something like that and uh, can you look at that and try and see what i meant when i said we know how the end of assyria came about. Nehum 3:15 what do we find it says there the fire will devour you and so a prophet is prophesying against assyria he says a fire will devour nineveh assyria 
and that is the that is uh, the, the sword will cut you off it will eat you up like a locust so that's the end of assyria so you find uh, the fire effects of fire as prophesied in uh, nehum so yeah essentially unfortunately this uh, babylon section um, the later babylon artifact section is closed today it's a uh, it's not a large room but in a small room we have plenty of artifacts um, related to nebuchadnezzar related to um, um, a person before him um, and a couple of other uh, kings after him like uh, amul merodach or evil merodach um, and then finally and more crucially also is uh, belzeshah nebonidus and belzeshah but uh, the very important point we wanted to verify here was people have been telling for a long time that you know what jude um, babylon never the last of the kings of babylon was a king called nebonidus not belzeshah so the challenge they brought in in regards to the bible was but the bible speaks about a belzeshah being the one who the medo persians captured you can't have a belzeshah because there is no such king in the list of kings of babylon it it all ends with nebonidus um so that was the challenge for a while until we found artifacts where we clearly found nebonidus was in fact the last king except he had his son belzeshah as a co-regent on his throne and this nebonidus um even though they are co-regents this nebonidus was in the habit of visiting in this particular case arabia very often because he had turned away from sun god worship to moon god worship and this is where uh, islam and tracing roots of islam would really come in shamash is supposed to be the sun god and sin or shin is supposed to be the moon god and he babylon is supposed to have the sun god as their as their main god but he moved away from that to 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 devoting his life to the moon god and that we find, uh, find from archaeological artifacts what we also find is to to emphasize his devotion he was frequently making trips to arabia so the question is why is moon god in arabia and here is where we can trace back all the moon based religious system in arabia uh, back to uh, what he was doing also anyway point is what we find is because he wasn't there it was almost as if belzeshar was the sole king most of the times he was there but belzeshar still is a core region technically and therefore because he almost is like a king himself in the book of daniel we don't find a reference to nebonidus uh but because he acknowledges that his father was the is the original king and he is just co-regent he then says when he when he acknowledges the interpretation that daniel gives he essentially says you will be the third in our kingdom in terms of authority the third and uh, in the bible of course without having found some of these details we wouldn't have known why he said third as opposed to second because he is supposed to be the first if we if we didn't know about nebonidus he would be the first belzeshah and so if you appoint someone just after him it will be the second why did he say the third uh, quite out of the blue the, the, uh, so that we understand had a very important significance because of the details we find which is he himself was only the second because his father was the first um, and therefore daniel when he appoints daniel as the guy next to him he'll be the third this is supposed to be the ancient iran so i was very curious of the kinds of artifacts you can find from saudi arabia which is almost nothing anyway so here we are in the persian section and the persian ancient persian um, ancient iran the persian rulers of course you have the medo persians sassanid empire and so on so um, you have uh, the medo persian i would just call uh, the initial uh, empire is called achaemenid empire so in persia you had a succession of empires uh, sassanid was the empire by the time of muhammad and so on so muhammad would be fighting against the byzantines so the byzantines were the roman were the roman uh, version of his time roman version of his time. the the romans of course in in the roman empire you had multiple different empires and the empire the version of empire in the roman empire 
during the time of Muhammad was Byzantine that he interacted with. Similarly, the Persian Empire that he interacted with was Sassanid. So you, you find all these um, very sophisticated things uh, coming up during this time also in the um, Persian Empire. Cool. So, yeah, that's just to get an idea of how the Persians captured all sorts of different people groups. Uh, Cyrus the Great was supposed to be an inspiration for uh, Alexander the Great. So that's where we get the idea of uh, how to get a worldwide empire ideas came from. Um, so yeah, so you see how the Persians had captured Lydians and Cappadocians and so on. There's even Indians captured. These are the equivalents of current day stone carvings. If you were to open a, a airport, you know, Queen Elizabeth, when she, uh, which, which ship was that uh, that she recently launched? When she launched there, there was a commemorative stone. So the, these are supposed to be seen like that. They, they wanted to essentially say, I am the great one. You better listen to me. <laughs> That's the sort of idea you'd see, um, see across in these sorts of things. The attention I wanted to have was on that, on that um, artifact, which is, also, which is called Cyrus Cylinder. Uh, who was the guy who led the uh, Israelites back, the Judeans, sorry, the Jews back to the nation of Judah, that was Cyrus. And what this cylinder has, Cyrus cylinder, what this cylinder has, uh, you should find actually the description there in that, in that placard. What this cylinder has, like you, like, like uh, some of the other artifacts of the film for the there's plenty of information that's like, and what do you find is Cyrus essentially saying, <laughs> allowed different foreign people groups who were forced to come on exile to Persia to return back. To return back to their own homelands and begin building their own temples. So, homelands and their own temples. He doesn't specifically mention Judeans, Jews there, because I think he has uh, taken, he, by this time he had he had, um, he had uh, intended for every people group to go back and build their own temples. Now this is a bit interesting because the Bible of course talks about Jews being allowed back. The Bible has plenty of details related to that. The Bible has uh, information on plenty of other Persian emperors in precise details, some very historical uh, details which unfortunately can't verif be verified in British Museum but which can be studied through artifacts from other um, collections across the world. Um, but the point also is uh, the prophet. Uh, I think it was Prophet Isaiah who prophesied that Cyrus would be his would be a would be a Messiah that God would appoint. But then he'd go on to say that Cyrus wouldn't even recognize that it is me who is sent who is speaking to him. In other words, that would match with what Cyrus ended end up doing here. Ends up doing here. From Cyrus' view, somehow some God was speaking to him. Hmm asking him to return people back to their own homelands and build temples but he didn't realize it was Yahweh and that is that is something recorded in the Bible um, and that is why he ends up uh, in a, as a benevolent um, action he ends up sending back every foreign group who have been forced on exile returning back and allowing every foreign group to build their own temples I mentioned this briefly earlier, where you know, as uh, Sennacherib had encamped, had a siege around Jerusalem, um, and uh, he was trying to negotiate with Hezekiah. He uh, threatened Hezekiah, not negotiate. Threatened Hezekiah to just surrender. Hezekiah was trying to negotiate, and remember at that time, I said that at a particular point, Sennacherib heard a rumor that. Uh, uh, Tiharka, the king of Egypt, Tiharka was intending to attack Assyria. He heard the rumor and when he heard the rumor, he wanted to expedite the threaten, threats to Hezekiah and he'd say, oh, don't, don't, don't think Tiharka could help you or protect you. This Tiharka, the Bible also talks about how Tiharka, um, how Hezekiah wanted some sort of an alliance with Tiharka. The Bible talks about that. Um, so anyway, Senegal would go on to say, don't think Tiharka could save you. You better, 
you better surrender and that kind of thing. And then finally, only with the 185,000 soldiers dying, he'll, he'll leave Lakish and go back. Sphinx of Taharka, so that's an Egyptian pharaoh, Taharka. We have a much larger, much larger um, artifact in the Egyptian section. But this is the, the this is the, um, I'm su I suppose a smaller artifact sort of collection. What's interesting as well as I was reading this is that there were actually Nubian kings who came in and so a lot, some of these you can see that the features they're actually Nubian yes. rather than Egyptian but they were yes. ruling so, in Egypt. That, that, that is a very interesting point. So essentially today unless we know some specific details we might think all Egyptian pharaohs were Egyptian, you know, modern day Egyptian in origin. But when we go through the details of history, in, go through history in detail, we find no, that's not really true. You find pharaohs, you find, of course, they were headquartered in the Nile Delta, either in the upper or in the lower, or maybe combine them. But you had pharaohs coming from all sorts of different regions who conquered and who ruled as pharaohs in Egypt. Uh, like, uh, how Susan rightly pointed out, that's in that's most likely a Nubian, uh, so it's a Sudanese, uh, Ethiopian, Sudanese sort of uh, person who is ruling Taharka. That's Taharka, Tirhaka, as recorded in the Bible, but Taharka, as um, as he is called uh, outside of the Bible. Um, so we have a few different Assyrian kings mentioned in the Bible, few different Babylonian. Um, Babylonian emperors mentioned in the Bible and a few Egyptian uh, kings also or pharaohs also mentioned in the Bible like Pharaoh Nico, uh, King Teherka, um, So King of Egypt and, um, and Shishak King of Egypt and so on. So they, they can also be studied in detail. So with that I think I think that's pretty much what we could see today apart from Egypt. Oh, uh, what have we done today apart from the fact of the closed uh, um, Babylonian, later Babylonian uh, section and the fact that we haven't checked out the Egyptian um, section. What we have done is we have gone through artifacts related to Israel, Assyria, some early creation going up to Abraham artifacts. Um, and then Babylonian artifacts we didn't see today and then Persian finally Persian finally so we have, we have gone through those now just to take a step back and see how these all fit in let's put it this way there are only a few major worldwide empires when I say worldwide I don't mean the entire world but a reasonable coverage of the world there are only a few worldwide empires that the entire human history has given to us or shown us. Four of which are recorded in the Bible. Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Rome. And if you go through the book of Daniel, some very specific details of these world empires are recorded. The only things which have been left behind are maybe things like the modern British Empire and a few other, a couple of other things which, um, um, which weren't as global as some of the other empires but which were around in the world. The point is, the Bible is a very, very historical document with plenty of claims, very many claims about not alone Israel and Judea, not alone about the family of Abraham, but also about all sorts of other people groups. Precise details of what they did, how they did, when they did and so on. You know, you might have heard um, a, a saying which I'm, I'm trying to far paraphrase. I don't remember the exact saying, but maybe one of you might remember. The, the saying, uh, the paraphrase, my paraphrase of that is something like, um, the moment a fool opens his mouth, it's confirmed that he is a fool. In other words, the moment claims are made, the person who makes those claims becomes extremely vulnerable because when, when claims are made, people can then verify if the claims are accurate. And that's when he becomes vulnerable. If he is not accurate, of course, he'll be found to be a liar as someone who doesn't know what he's talking about. But the fact of the matter is the Bible has many, many claims. 
very precise, well-defined claims. And what we have done today is going through a museum like the British Museum. What we have found is all related artifacts that we find in the British Museum attest to the Bible's veracity. It's not alone true with the artifacts in the British Museum. You can go to any museum in the world. In my knowledge, in my study, across the world, we so far haven't found even one archaeological artifact which essentially says the Bible is wrong. None found so far. There are artifacts which either don't talk about the things that the Bible talks about, let's say about China or somewhere else, India, or wherever. Those kinds of artifacts exist. But when they do talk about things which, which are related to what the Bible talks about, they always are in conformity to the details that the Bible gives. In other words, I'm making two specific points. Point number one, the Bible makes many precise claims and therefore makes itself vulnerable. Point number one. Point number two, all available archaeological artifacts either confirm or talk about something else. In other words, nothing exists in the entire world which would deny the veracity of the Bible. Such is the historicity of what we have in the Bible. And therefore, Yahweh God, Jesus on the cross is someone we all of us may need to run to. We need to come to Him. We can't deny Him. We can't reject Him. We really need to come to Him and say, God, we appreciate your love. We also appreciate the fact that you have made the Bible historically rich so that people of the 21st century can come to you in a verifiable way after going through details, not needing to come to you through blind faith. We can study in detail and we can come to you and we receive you, Jesus. Thank you, is what we all must be saying. And I'm assuming all of us had a good time today. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts you wanted to share? Well, it's been amazing. A lot of, lot, lot of names and things to take in. I'm glad it's been recorded so that we can go back and study it. But uh, it's amazing that you can see, as you said, that everything is verifiable, that everything that we, we see artifacts confirm what's in the Bible. So that's uh, you know, very affirming and good to know. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Any other thoughts? Cool. So day. with that, and uh, we, we close our um, visit today. Yes. And God willing, we'll uh, plan something uh, slightly better the next time. We'll check out if any of these things are closed. We need to still uh, check out the um, Babylonian artifacts. So hopefully next time, God willing, um, uh, hopefully we'll also announce the dates in advance. But God willing, um, we'd be able to have a reasonably more comprehensive look at the British Museum. And uh, maybe someday in the future, God willing, also to other museums in the world. Louvre Museum, uh, there's a Ashmolean Museum in Oxford and so on. All sorts of other museums from where we can gather a few other important details. Um, and also looking forward to the New Testament um, related um, artifacts, mainly literary, but also some um, archaeology um, artifacts also some other time. Thank you very much. God's richest blessings to you. you. See you.